Well, I guess I better get started here. Um, so let's get this back. So I'm talking today on, on MQTT and Node-RAD and, and basically how you connect up the Internet of Things. Uh, my name's Kurt Carlson. I'm a retired telecommunication engineer. Uh, but I've been using Linux for a long time, or at least Unix, and uh, various things. So if you, the slides and some of the code that I have to do this presentation are up on GitHub, if you want to find that stuff. Um, anyway, we'll just get into it. So MQTT is, uh, you know, it's a fairly simple protocol for just moving data from one point to another. So a lot of it's done in the... Uh, small collection devices like Raspberry Pis or Arduinos. And it was something that was invented at, uh, at IBM to uh, try to make it so that they could easily uh, visualize the programming stuff that they were trying to do. And, uh, or, well, I, I, not, but I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. There's two things that were invented at uh, IBM, but this, this one is just the messaging protocol. So it's a pretty simple protocol. And to start off with, they have two node types. They have a client and a broker. And so the client either produces or consumes information, and you have a broker that acts kind of like a switchboard. It just it switches messages from one place to another. And uh, to bring the broker up on, on Linux is pretty simple because it's like on uh, app get install mosquito and that's all you have to do the thing's up it's running you never have to configure it it just it just runs so it's a for me at least it was a really simple way of bringing something up I, I didn't expect anything to be that simple on the on these things um, so how it works it's basically a publish and sub subscribe scheme and so nodes will publish data to the broker and then the broker sits there and looks and sees who's subscribed to that information and then it it forwards those, those data messages on to the, uh, the people that have subscribed to it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so uh, so you, you basically you subscribe to the data that you want. And then there's, if you're using the, a message protocol, there is some protocol to establish and, and take down the connections. And that, that level of, overhead goes up if you're going to be using the uh, TLS. But the basic messages that they use are really simple. I mean, it's just a connect. Sometimes you have a connect ACK and a publish and a, uh, a subscribe message, and then sometimes a subscribe ACK. If you get into the deeper parts of the protocol, there's a, couple, there's a few other messages. And I'll kind of go over these things a little bit, but for the most part, they're not terribly important. Uh, MQTT works off of a real simple stru uh, structure. It's got two things. It has a topic, what kind of data are you passing, and a payload, you know, what, what do you want that data to be? Now, usually it can be simple. It can be just a string or an integer, but if you need to pass something more complex, you can pack it into JSON, and depending on your implementation, it can be quite large. I mean, like into the megabytes that you're passing along, which, you know, it seems absurd to me, but I'm playing around with Arduinos, and you would never conceive of packing around megabyte off of an Arduino. There's three other parameters that you might use. Uh, quality of service, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Retention basically says, do you want the broker to keep that data around? On Mosquito, it only keeps one copy. So as soon as you send the next one up, the last one's gone. So it's the retention is basically just last message. And then duplicate is needed for some of the protocol because they do have a retransmission if you have a higher uh, level of quality of service. Uh, the, on the subscription side, when you ask for something, you, you can sit there and ask for each topic one at a time, but that's sort of tedious. You know, you'd really like to be able to ask for a whole bunch of data at the same time. And so they have wildcards that allow you to do that. So if you if you use the topic to structure the data in the, you know, how you do that is implementation dependent. So like the way I do it is each uh, node would have a node name and then there'd be what kind of data it is and then a value. And then it may have more divisions or, or less how you want to do that. Um, but anyway, the plus will supply 
one level of that. So like if you put plus where the I have a node name, that would pick up all of the node names. If you put in pound temperature, it would pick up all of the, the devices that send temperature. Or if you say pound value, it, it would pick up all the values that it would have. Um, anyway, st the Again, this you know when you're asking for a topic, it's it's a, it's a string. Um, when you format the topic itself, that goes that a uh, that when you publish it, it, it can hit use it's another string of characters. Again, it's you free format it however you want it to be for your your implementation or, or group of nodes that you're trying to collect from. Uh, you can use any character you want except for the plus and the pound because obviously you can't that would screw up the protocol if you use those two. Uh, they use slashes to designate this hierarchy of data. So I guess I was getting a little ahead of myself. So like, again, the way I was doing it was like, uh, I have a node name and then I, I subdivided, you know, temperature and then the units and value, whatever it is. Um, and so this, this basically says what I was talking about earlier, something a little bit out of sequence about how you use the wildcards to be able to pull up multiple pieces of data at one time. Uh, payload again is variable length and it's free format so you basically however your application is whatever kind of d information that you're trying to pass that's the format that you're going to use uh, strings and, and integers are basically built in you don't have to do anything with it in uh, this demo if I could get it to work which I can't at the moment uh, it uses JSON because it basically is passing around an array of numbers and so it would be passing around an, you know, a, a simple array of numbers. Um, so the quality of service is, there's three levels of quality of service on this thing. And, and QoS zero is just basically a fire and forget. And um, so if you look at the message sequence for that, you mean, it's just basically you send a publish request and that's it. It just goes up and you, you, you don't know if it made it you, or, and you don't care. And that's good enough for a lot of things that you do. In fact, this is the only one I've ever used. Uh, they have at least once, and what at least once means that the thing's going to get acknowledged. And if it's not acknowledged, you will continue, the, uh, the sender will keep on sending. So these things, when I'm talking about a sender, that can either be the client going toward a receiver, which is the broker, or it can be the other way around where the broker is sending to the, a client. And so this diagram kind of works both ways. So again, you, pu you publish until you receive an ACK if you're on, on a level one. And then level two is that you want this thing to go through only once. And so then you have to keep track of the, the message identifiers a little bit closer. And this is you publish until you get a, uh, an ACK. And then once you get that, then you release that number. And so there's two places in here where the sender can repeat a, a transmission until it gets essentially back an act for that particular transmission. So this is, to me, is overkill for most stuff, but I mean, if you have a particular use case, maybe you need that, kind, that level of uh, reliability. Um, so when you start, when you use uh, MQTT, the first things I used it for was to be a front end to uh, Open Hab, and so I never really got into Node Red, and then I saw a demo on Node on Node Red, and said, "Oh, this is pretty cool." So it's this wiring tool that you can wire up nodes and manipulate messages and uh, do some some neat things with it. Um, again, this is another tool that was invented at IBM, and it it really is a it's it, it's well it's I don't know exactly what to do here. Um, So it's been part of Ras uh, Raspbian. So it's been on the Raspberry Pi for a while, and it's basically built using JavaScript on top of Node uh, Node.js. And so it, it sets up a client instance that you, you can get into with a regular browser. You can see what's going on there. Again, this is another thing that's pretty simple to install. There's quite a few recipes on the, on the network to do it. And uh, because Node.red is written in Node.js, it's been extended. So the version that's on 
the Raspberry Pi has the the GPIO for the Raspberry Pi is built is basically built into it already. I mean, I suppose you could take it out if you wanted to, but it's built in. But then there's this other module that you can add to it, which is the dashboard. And after using the dashboard, I don't say use the thing without it. I mean, it's like this. It's it's a, a, a cool thing to do. So uh, we'll get into this thing. The way that Node Red saves the messages off is as a they call them flows, and they they. For this talk is used over using a lot of words, but uh, a flow basically is all of the programming that the user puts into the thing, and it saves that off as a uh, as a JSON document. And so then you can take that JSON document and, sa and mail that to somebody else, and they can load it up on their machine, have exactly the same configuration. So uh, a node in in uh, Node Red basically is something that manipulates the message. So it may input the message, it may consume the message, it may transform it in some way. And uh, to do the simplest case is that you just have uh, an injection node and a debugging node. And so I, I can't show you everything, but at least I can show you that. Um, get on the right page here. So, and I'll even start from nothing. So this is the, when you access Node Red, you bring up this page. And so it's got, um, is that right? Okay. How do I get that to work? Um, nope. Well, I'll do it this way. So basically, it brings up the pane, and you got, um, does this show up? Nope, that doesn't show up either. There are three panes on the window when you hit it with the browser. So the left-hand uh, pane has a bunch of the nodes that you can put in there. So that's a, a scrollable list, and you can go down there and you pick them off, and you, <laughs> you can't read that at all. But why don't I see if I can get this thing? I don't know how to, let's see. Well, I don't know if I'm gaining or losing. <laughs> Let's just try to. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody know the command on Linux to make it talk to the second screen? Maybe it's uh, F7 here. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out which one of these keys does it, and it's not that any of those. So whatever node. <laughs> oh, wonderful. F8, you think? Yeah, it's not on this machine. Well, maybe it is. Well, I, I see it's a brightness. Well, that's what it is on here, but I'm trying to. Um, let me see if there's a, let's find settings here. You're right, F7. Uh, displays. You know what? Yeah. What can I, what I want to see, a, I want to mirror. mirror. I, I want to do mirror is what I really want, because then that way. Uh, apply we'll keep this okay I think we're in we're in business okay so and you can't see this either so let's make this bigger oh that's too big okay <laughs> so in order to just do something simple just so you have three panes this the pane on the left has got a whole bunch of nodes that you can implement the thing in the middle is this workspace that you can work with, and then there's some information things that you could do on the, on the, on the right-hand side. So what I want to do is I want to inject a message. So I just drag over and inject, and I want to have something that displays that message. So I bring over this debugging node. And then to connect them, I just grab onto the, uh, this little connector port and drag that over to the other node. So I've wired up those two nodes. That's all there is to that. Now, if I want to see what this thing's going to do, I need to deploy it. 
So the, okay, these little blue circles on top of the nodes right here and here tell you that that hasn't been deployed. So you need to basically compile it into this JSON. So you uh, do the compiling, everything goes away. And now I want to see what's going to happen with this. I'm going to put this thing into a debugging mode. So it brings up uh, the output of this, this message. And if I just click on here, this will inject the message. It tells me I injected the, the timestamp. And then that timestamp shows up on the right-hand side. But I didn't want to really do a timestamp. I want what I really want to do is I want to say hello world because you gotta you gotta do that. So I'm going to change the timestamp to be a string, and then I'm going to make it uh, the string. I just wanted to say hello world. And if I want to, I can go into this node and I can uh, make that status come out on it too. So now if I redeploy that. And I click on this, I've injected hello world. We see hello world comes out, the debugging string. And then underneath here, the status shows up as the hello world. So it's a really easy tool to use. <laughs> if I, you, know, you want to see that, I'll just break it. We'll just break it and we'll de do a deploy it again. And then when I say hello world, it says I injected that message but nothing new came out. So you have to have it wired up. So th that's the simple one. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was going to show you how all this stuff down here works. And uh, this is a little bit more than what I can do in 15 minutes to get it all hooked up. <laughs> It's okay, no, uh, Node Red only talks to the broker. So it doesn't care. And so I've had this thing cooked up to uh, one wire devices. So there was a little Python script that, that pumped it into the broker. I've had things that scraped the web and pumped it into the broker. Uh, I'm going to show you another thing where you, know, you don't need to write those Python scripts anymore. You just do it yourself. Because, I mean, what happens, uh, I'm going to say we want to know the weather for Charlotte. So I've, I've got, I'm cheating a little bit here. So I've got a button that injects nothing, but it triggers this HTTP request. And so if I, if I fire that off, it gets this thing that, well, it's got a lot of extra stuff in there. And it doesn't look like what I want it to look like either. Oh, I, I know what the problem is there. Um, I'm not on the internet. And I, I'm not going to get there. But anyway, you can sit there and do web requests. I mean, when you look at what this thing does, so this one was an HTTP request, and so it goes out to the web to get something. So you can have it set up on a timer to go pull the stuff. Um, <laughs> i got to get back to the presentation, but uh, let's see if I can get there. Hello. Yeah. I, I, t I, t I, tell you, I tell you what, I, look, look, I'll do the presentation, then we'll try to come back and do this thing, if, if that's okay, because I mean, the, most of this presentation was based on showing this thing, so I'm going to be over pretty quick. Um, I need to get this thing in the slideshow. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, it's... <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, well, it's, it's... I had a lot of fun doing that, but okay. Um, so originally, they called this thing an event wiring tool. And I thought that was a nutso name. But once you start hooking these things up, it's just like wiring. I mean, just, you just drag that connector from one node to another, and you hook them up. Um, we've talked about that. We've talked about that. Um, we've talked about that. We've talked about that. We've done that. This is, OK, we've done, done this. Um, <coughs> Okay, to do that conversion stuff, I mean, you basically write a function. So uh, what this thing was going to do is if I had it work, this thing goes out and, and it 
queries a website, and it pulls down a, a piece of text that looks like JSON, but it's a string. You can't do anything with the string. So the first thing you got to do, you run it through another node that turns that JSON string into a, an object. Once it's an object, then you can sit there, you can access it. And so like, uh, I want to get the temperature from here. And so then you have the, ob the object. So the, um, what gets passed to a function is a message, MSG. It's got two basic components to it, topic and payload. And so here I wanted to get the payload, but because I've got an object, it's got two more levels to it. So there's a temperature and a value. And I load that into a temp ver you know, variable called temp, and then I start manipulating it. You know, I convert it from Fahrenheit to centigrade, back, excuse me, Celsius. Then I, then I round it down, I turn it back into a string, so it's got a degree F sign on it, and then I could output the thing. So, I mean, so writing functions is a piece of cake in here. They're all written in JavaScript. They're just simple pieces of text. I mean, this is a relatively complex one because it's doing four th different things at once. You know, it's a bit, but you don't need to have four functions to do it each in the little steps. You can just do it all at once. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool to do that. Um, and then, you know, it went to a, a node to, to display it. And I did the same thing with the dew point. And if we could talk to this pie down here on the floor, we could calculate humidity. But it's on the floor. We'll, we'll get to that here in a half a second, maybe, if we get there. OK. And we just talked about that. Okay, the dashboards. That's all on the Pi. Okay, so the dashboards, you load this thing, it gives you a bunch of modules that you can put in there. And when you have those modules, you can make, um, you can have a graph, you can have a dial, you can have things that input text, you can display things as text, and you build those things up. It goes to a separate little web page. And then you can access that web page with your phone or your uh, desktop or whatever. So it gives you a lot easier way to interact with what's going on in Node-RED. So you get the data in or out of Node-RED using that dashboard. So it's, I don't, to me, this is, the, it is one of the key tools for doing that. So this is an example of one of those dashboards that you build up. It just, it has a bunch of controls, which, you know, you can click on those things. And then it has some status messages on the right-hand side. And this is like how it would format for a desktop. If you were just a phone, it just makes it a narrower format so that you scroll up and you can still see everything, but it's just a narrow format. And again, this is garden variety stuff. I wasn't doing anything fancy with that to make that work. Okay, so this demo. I'll t we'll see if we can get it to work. This was set up for STEM fairs. I go to these, I, I use my retirement time. I go to STEM fairs, teach kids about IT and I, this is a, a cool setup because it's got hardware, it's got software, it's got messaging, you know, so it's got flashing lights. And as we all know, growing up with Star Trek, is computers work with flashing lights. And so it's got all this stuff. And so I thought, well, this is great. And then I, I built it around um, Conway's Game of Life, which a lot of you don't know what that is. But in the 70s, it was one of the biggest wastes of computer time there was because everybody, I don't care who you were, were studying this stuff. And I saw people carrying around reams of paper like this, looking at the generations of life. And it was, it was nuts. But they were looking for stuff. And when you go up on the website, there are still people doing it, only they're doing a lot bigger arrays. I mean, these things are huge. Um, anyway, it must have gone the wrong way. For those of you who don't know what life is, it's a simple game. It's uh, based on cellular automata, which basically says each cell can determine its next state by not querying the other states. It can look at the other s states, but it doesn't have to have any coordination or anything. So if it only has zero or one neighbors, it dies because it's isolated. Does it have two or three neighbors? That's in the sweet spot. It gets to live again. If it has more than three, it dies because it's overcrowded. And if you're dead and you're touched by exactly three cells, you are given life. And that's basically the game. So, you, you know, you basically you die unless you are touched by two or three cells or you're and, and alive or you are dead and you're touched by exactly three. So it's, it's, I, it's a, an interesting game. Raspberry Pi is the hub. So all of these devices... Uh, feed into the Pi. The Pi is, 
Oh, okay, okay, I'll talk about the device. Look, I'm trying to define them as dumb so they don't do anything. They're basically like a keyboard and a display. That, that, that level of dumbness. They're not supposed to do anything. All the functionality was, is implemented up in Node-RED. Um, the Raspberry is my hub, so it's, uh, it's the Wi-Fi access point, it's the router, it's the broker, it's the Node-RED server, and it has the dashboard server for the, for the GUI. <laughs> if, I can't, if I can't talk to the Pi, I can't do anything. Um, I don't want to talk about security. Let's, if you want to know about security, you, you pull up the slide deck, and it's, it talks about um, basically how you try to secure this thing, because out of the box, Node-RED has no security. Everything is wide open. It's really easy to use. If you want to secure it, you have to go in and start doing some bells and whistles. Mainly, you turn on TLS and, and get that working, and then you put passwords on top of TLS. And, and even after you do all of that nonsense, it, I don't think it's secure enough to do um, a security system. You like, like to monitor windows and doors and that kind of thing because it's all, most implementations are going to be based on some wireless protocol. It may not be Wi-Fi. It may be mesh. It may be something else. But any wireless protocol can be jammed or uh, do a denial of service on it, and I, I don't see how you can get around that. I mean, I don't, know how, I don't know how they get away with it on the commercial systems because they've all got the same problem. In fact, well, my wife made me buy a, uh, or we bought a uh, security system for the home. And I look at that thing and I, and I don't feel secure. My wife feels secure. I don't feel secure. But that's, I mean, because it's, ba it's this, the, new, the new stuff is based on Wi-Fi. So that says you have to have an access point that's up all the time, even if they cut the power to the house, and it has to have a modem up all the time. Again, same problem. Or you spend the extra bucks and put in a cellular modem, and then you're worried about whether the cell call can, can get through or whether you got coverage in the house or not at that, at that point in time. I mean, because the you know, cells move all the time. Anyway, so let's see if we can get this thing to work. Uh, first, we'll see if we can talk to the Pi. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not going to type worth beans here. This is funny. I got the jitters. OK. Well, you're not on the stage when <laughs> having stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and it's still not tight. The access port. Yeah, I mean, that's what this wire is here. Well, I don't trust Wi-Fi. <laughs> well, I mean... All these nodes are connected with <laughs> Wi-Fi, and uh, I'm hoping that they can find that thing. The Pi is powered up, but I am certainly not hitting it, e even with a wired connection. Um, just give me... Uh, see if I can get in this way. And that's not going to work either. Oh, you can't even see what I'm doing. I should make it at least bigger so you can see what I'm, what I'm fussing with. I'll give you half a chance. Well, I don't, I think your suggestion of rebooting the Pi might be okay, but. Uh, well, you know something? No. I guess what it should do is hook that up to here. Uh, let's see if it comes up. Are there any questions while well, this thing's booting? <laughs> I might as well try to use the time. <laughs> Oh, 
I didn't know that you could do that. Anyway, so I don't, look, I'll repeat for the for the camera. He's asking a question about whether I've used TLS on the broker. And my answer is no, but he was expressing his experience that he has done it and turned it on so that it works for external access only, but not for the, the set of nodes that he has on his internal network. Let's see if I can summarize that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, so it's nice to be able to, he uses two ports, one that uses TLS and one that doesn't. I was afraid of using TLS because I didn't know, think I was going to be able to run TLS efficiently on these. Uh, they're essentially uh, Arduino boxes, but they're, it's, I'm using a particle photon because it's got a little bit more punch than, a, than an Arduino, but not enough. And this is not... Is that right? Well, uh, did that stop it? This is interesting. Well, um, see, I, I, I can't see. Okay, let's tell me when there's, oh, here, I, I, let me find an interesting pattern. So this is a bunch of, oh, I don't, I'm not showing what I've got. I've got a keyboard here. So this is so the kids get inner crap. Oh, excuse me. They get inner patterns. And so this is a pattern. This is a bunch of beacons. And so if I push this button, it, you know, a, a, a beacon basically just goes back and forth between two states. So you're, if you look at the other monitors, they're going to be pretty live. This one, it's got a little slowness problem, but it'll catch up. Eventually, so let's let's see if I can find an acorn. There's a whole bunch of static patterns. Uh, so, yeah, it goes up and comes down. But then, when the, when the life game happens, I'm going to just play with this pattern for a little bit because this illustrates part of the problem I'm having with this particular device. It's not real time. And so this pattern will alternate between two states. Oh no, it's going to take off on its own. So I'm going to press and hold this and let it take off. This one, you see it's got different colors. That's because of the way it's updating. Each generation's got a different color, and this one's not, genera not updating very fast. So when it's all one color, then it's done. Sometime, <laughs> but anyway, it was. <laughs> no, but all of them are doing subs, because this one I I I, I control it with. Uh, this, but it tells the Node Red to publish stuff down, so Node Red's doing all the publishing. So Node Red is actually acting as a client off of the broker. So it's just another box, but it's, Node Red is doing the publishing. But this takes a long time. I didn't think it took this long when I was doing it at home. Okay, um, so let me see if, um, this bothers me, I can't see it on here. Um, oh, I got some going on. So if I g bear with me a half a second. Oh, I got to get into the other one. Let's just see if we can get in. Wouldn't that be two? Fingers crossed. I don't think I'm getting in. Let's try a different thing. Let's. I'm going to crap this out. <laughs> And um, I'm going to see if I can hook to the Pi wi on the, <laughs> the Wi-Fi network. Uh. <laughs> there it goes. Oh, 
Oh, perfect. Okay. So I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so in general, when I... Okay, um, this is a little bit different than what you saw before because now all of a sudden I'm using a lot of tabs in that central, uh, the central pane. And I'm going to take the trellis one. So the, the way I develop the code is I generate a whole bunch of these things that are just basically debug statements. And so I can turn them on. Oh, oh by, by clicking on the, this little thing, you can turn the debug message on and off. So you set these things up to debug as you go through. And I, I just leave the junk there. I probably should get rid of it when I get done. But to, uh, let me see if we can, uh, can we flip one of these matrices? No, I need to, uh, I need to lo load a pattern. Now once that's loaded, I think I can, well, that's not working at the moment either. This switch box, let me manipulate the matrix so I can rotate it. I can shift it up, shift it down, do some stuff with it. But, but just to show you the life game is enough uh, to show you what's going on with that. So I'll get down here to where the life is. Um, I'm going to back off on this so you can see. The, uh, you, know, you guys have heard about spaghetti code. Oops. This stuff actually looks like spaghetti. But it's... I could probably clean this up, but one of the problems I found with Node-RED, which is sort of interesting, is that when you make a function, is you can't replicate it. You can't link it to another copy of it. So if you want, you know, like you make three copies of it, and you say, oh, God, I, have, I need to change it. Now you've got to make changes in all three of the nodes, where if I just draw this connector in there, then it's all hooked up. So the game of life itself is this. Oops, I'm going to make it bigger again so you can see what's going on. Is this basic node here, and this is the most complicated node in the whole thing. So I'm, I'm just going to show you what the text looks like for that. Uh, it's got a subroutine that counts the neighbors, and then there's another subroutine that goes through and figures out what the next state should be, and that's it. That's the most complicated one. So I mean, basically, this thing I I I am really impressed with this tool. Once you got it working, oh, I know what I was going to do. Is that like 70 lines? That That's 70 lines in that one. Most of these things, when there's, I mean, like this grid to matrix, I'm going from a, a, a grid is, I, I define the grid as, as a binary matrix, so it's a 256 or bit, or 256 array of Booleans, and I convert that into an array that I sent down to these panels, it's a 16 number array of 16 bit numbers. I mean, so I'm doing simple, I'm not trying to send down those e individual color. I just send down a color command and a, uh, in this array. Um, but what this one, we can show the, the, dash, the uh, dashboard thing. So um, if I pull up, guess what? Someone secured this. Um, So th th it's basically the same thing the slide had. Uh, for this is for the life game. And so like what it's tell telling you is it, it I, I will run the life thing again so that we can see how that works in real time. I'm just going to take a, this shows you um, just to play around with a, a demo. So it shows you a simple gauge. And I think I got one that's got a bunch of more gauges on it. And these should all be on there. So like this, the light one is, re is, uh, is real time. I should be able to turn that off. <coughs> and then come back up again. So I mean, so built into this is, a, uh, it's an add-on. If you add on the dashboard, then this stuff, come, you know, you get to play around with these things. So uh, if we ran longer, these graphs would work. But the, you saw the gauge work at least the one. I mean, the temperature is kind of hard to, to show temperature in real time. So let's go back to the life game. And um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to cheat a little bit. Um, I'll bring up a simple pattern. 
And now if I go through one generation, let's see if we can make that bigger. Uh, bigger is better. This, this thing. I mean, I, I, di I didn't implement the life part as a dashboard. I've, I was having too much fun with this box. I mean, I've, I mean this, this thing is a time waster. I mean, I'm, I'm back in the 70s, wasting time, except I'm not using reams of paper. I'm just using gobs of time. So, again, this is one at a time. If I get lazy, I push and, I push and hold this, let it go. But that's all in no dread. So, yeah, well, once it, it it's either going to be dead or oscillating, or, well, or alive. I mean, it's, I, I compare every generation with every other generation to see if it's looping. Um, yeah, node red and all of these boxes are uh, nodes off of the broker. So Node Red is really it acts mainly as a publisher, it ca it, uh, but it subscribes to messages too. So it subscribes to the buttons. So when I press a button, it, you know, you capture the button, you do whatever you're going to do with it. I mean, so like I was going back and show you what this happens with that auto repeat. Oops, let's go the right direction. It's uh, it's in here. Uh, this one. So that auto repeat. So here I've got the, that button that you press. Uh, the switch statement basically says you want to capture the two states. Now, I don't think this is necessarily necessary here, but what it, a switch looks an awful lot like a, uh, a C switch statement or every other language, uh, JavaScript. So you can generate as many outputs here as you want. Sometimes you only need one, but like the switch has got two states. It's got on and off, and so it sends a one or a zero. And so sometimes you want to capture the zero. In this case, I do. Most of the time, I don't care. But I still use the switch statement, so I only pick up the one, the one transition. I don't want to be triggering off the, the off most of the time. This, in this case, I do want to trigger off the off. There's a one-second delay, and then once you have that one-second delay, then it does this resend. And the resend keeps going until it gets reset. I mean, so like if you look at this reset, there's all these things have got some configuration stuff that you have to do with it. So uh, you can pick whether you want the thing to be reset or wh whatever you want it to do the mode. But this one is to have it resend periodically. Uh, I picked 33 milli you know, 333 milliseconds to name out of the, the hat. Didn't really matter. I want the thing to be reset if it hits, has a trigger that's equal to zero. So when it gets done with the life game, I want it to stop. I don't want that thing to keep running, and then the next time you run life, it's still running. It, it has to stop somewhere. I could have stopped it on the zero transition of the button, but I want to walk away from the button. So I mean, so you got a lot of power in this thing. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else that you'd like to see? <laughs> now that we can see some of it. Um, the this dashboard tab over here. I mean, okay, on the when it's when the dashboard gets installed, it adds extra things over on the uh, the right hand pane. So the first one only had three panes. Now it's got five old sub panes. So this dashboard pane allows you to regroup things. So you don't they don't have to be in the order that the, that it finds them, and you you group them how you want. And that's what defines uh, how they display. So like the, you basically when you define the dashboard, it's a three by X matrix. And so you define your, when you define a button, uh, let's see, on, on life, there's one of these, um, I want to edit that flip horizontal button, it's just a typical button. I made it three by two, so it makes it three wide and two deep, just to make a pretty good sized button. Uh, you know, you label it, you, you know, um, those things had some icons on there, the little arrows. I don't know if you noticed, but anyway, there's a couple libraries you can bring in and bring in some icons. It's not as much as I'd like, but again, it's a pretty simple, easy tool. You, they have other people have implemented stuff that does the full 
HTML, CSS thing, and you can make your buttons look any way you want them to. But for quick and dirty, this is a pretty good tool. Where were you attaching that button to the action button? Oh, okay. Um, what th that would be like, um, I am pretty sure this is what, no, it's not. The, um, we, those were up above here. They were the, all the, the, the flips. So um, I think that's this button here. Oh, so like if I went down here, I'm, I'm showing you two things at the same time. I shouldn't do that. So when, when you, uh, so you, you can go up to social networking, you can store, I should talk about store too. So here's the Raspberry Pi stuff, and here's the dashboard. So you can have different kinds of switches and different kinds of things that you do. So these things just pull in like anything else. So this thing he's talking about is the button. So like this shift left is, is the same kind of button. So if you, you click on that, then you know it's got a size to it and you know the arrows and whatnot. So, so how that how that gets done. Um, yeah, you wire it into wherever the function is. I mean that was part of the problem I have with some of these things like so like this up. I've got three things that are fanning in. And it turns out that this function get matrix doesn't really do anything. It just says get this, you know, flow dot get, which a flow is a way of um, you store information in the context. So you think of this as like a global variable. They've got three levels of global variables, and this thing actually four, but uh, there's three basic ones. So you can have it within the node and within which. The node goes away as soon as it stops executing. It can be within the flow. A flow is one of those tabs. So when I'm talking about a tab, I'm talking about one of these tabs up here. Uh, and then they have another one that goes across all of the flows. This, uh, that thing when I was cycling through the different patterns, that's actually stored in a file. And so that's a, a third level, or a, a fourth level that you can put them into. And it was a pain, but it's kind of fun to get that to work too. Because it's the saved matrix, so it's when you get into the function, uh, they have the storage thing. So it goes into a file or comes out of a file. Subtle difference in the icon. You have to look where the arrow is. And so this is going into the into the file, and you know basically just says you know, store it in this file. And then when you pull it out of the file, you know it's going in as a string, and you don't know that because you didn't set it up. When you take it out of the file. You've got to convert it back into JSON. You've got to get back into that object format, and then you can do whatever you want to do with it. But it, it, it's fun. I mean, I don't, I, I can't, I, mean, I didn't think programming would be this much fun. You know, it just, you just took stuff up. It, it doesn't always work the first time, but, you know, you mess with it a little bit, and you get it to work. Um, I don't know. Any other questions? You know, I'm running out. Is the uh, your big one? Is that is that a shift? I mean, as far as the control, or you can do that. No. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about implementation a little bit. Uh, I don't know how much of this I can show you, but um, these are just toolboxes that you get at Home Depot or whatever. It's been modified a little bit. Let's see if I can get it open. It's idiot proof, I guess. It won't let me open. No, it's, I should not have opened it up that way. <coughs> it's still a port store. Um, so what it is, I'll just talk about it. Um, Adafruit is a great company. They sell all sorts of little gadgets for people that want to play with electronics. Kids, adults, big kids, whatever. They sell this kit that's a, or a, it's a board, a four by four matrix. And it, it used to not be lit up. Now it's lit up. And it, they call it a trellis board. And you can take the trellis boards and you can hook them up. So this is an array of 16 of those boards, 16 by 16. But it's, and it talks to all, to all of those 16 boards with one data wire. So you only hook up power, ground, and data. And so when it wants to update those LEDs, it has to go out. It selects the board, then it pumps 
data into that board for the lights. Now, I don't know if it's doing all 16 or if it's only doing one, but I, I suspect it's doing all 16. Then it goes to the next LED and does the same thing because it was taking over a millisecond to update each LED. That's, w that's why it's so damn slow. It, the keyboard scan had a 500 microsecond delay in there. I have no idea why that delay was in there. I took it out, worked fine for me, it's, except every once in a while this thing gets spastic, so it probably is necessary, but I didn't want to rewrite their drivers, because whoever their driver writer was, belong to the Richie Kernigan School of C programming, and so all of the names are either one or two characters. I mean, it's, you know, the only way to understand the program <laughs> is to <laughs> debug the entire thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of nuts. And, and for what I, you know, I didn't want to have to go through that kind of a pain just to get a little circuit card to work. So it's, I, I changed it so that it only updates one LED at a time and keeps the thing relatively Good. The, the, it has those rotary encoders on there, and the rotary encoders you have to, you have to pull them, but like every 20 milliseconds, or you're not going to get them. And it was making me do it every 50, and so I was turning right. It was saying I was turning left. It said, No, 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 no. This isn't right. I mean, it's, so it's it was messing it up. So I made it at least so they, they work sort of. They're not perfect, but they're better than they were. But. No, it's all uh, pi um, particle photon. Uh, a pi would be worse. Well, that's so that's the problem. With, okay, so like particle photon is a great device. I don't know if you ever used it or not, but it's it's a neat device. But it comes built in with this capability. It talks to particle I/O. Particle I/O is the cloud, and it keeps track of everything you do. So it it uses a protocol that's very similar to MQTT to get it up to the cloud. So the first thing it does when you power it up is it says, okay, Wi-Fi, are you there? And if Wi-Fi is not there, it stops. It's done. Then the next thing it does, it says, hey, Particle I.O., are you there? And if it's not there, it's done. And you sit there. So you have to take those two things and take them out. Then you have to put Wi-Fi back in to do this. And that's part of the reason you don't have control with real time is because this thing goes out and pulls Wi-Fi every once in a while, and when it's pulling Wi-Fi, you're not doing anything else. I mean, so your real time, if, you know, anytime you're trying to do communications like that, your real time goes to hell. You have to have a dedicated. It, it, it needs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, an Arduino, an Arduino would have enough power to run that, and then just use the the photon as a communication device. Right. I mean, something you need to have. Uh, you have to separate the communication device from the scanning device. I mean, it's, you can't have them in the same device. It just doesn't work. And that's the problem with pi. Well, a lot of things with pi is that. I don't know how much that got captured, but anyway, basically the comment was that you have to have a separation of the Pi and the microcontroller, and, or the communication of the microcontroller. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you for showing that. Yeah. I mean, we can play with the. Uh, the thing a little more if you want if you want to eat up the time, but well, I mean I can get it close, but it's uh, <laughs> you know I have to do it the old-fashioned way, put the boxes back together. <laughs> I never glued these things in. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> okay. Oh, I suppose that's not gonna work either. These things got no special place. Um, no, maybe not. Is it? Were you able? Oh no, that's the negative one together. Okay. They're just soldered together. Yeah. No. It, it, 
they're designed you've, you've to done do it that. So well, it looked like it was one, one board. Big board. No, it's not one board. It's sixteen <laughs> little dinky boards, and they're okay. Something's not letting it close. Well, I mean, like these are neopixels too, oh, but th but you talk to them as a string, and so and use FastLED on that, and so it can keep up. Oh, Where this oh, one, oh. this one, it uses some other goofy thing. Did you make? How did you do this? Is this Lexan? Or? No, I had to have a friend print that. Okay. <laughs> you I sat I there for three days with a drill. No, 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 no. He uh, printed it. it. Took him three times. Uh, yeah, later cut it might be that too because it's all black. But 